And friends, grace and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, like I said, it's been a while since I've been here. I almost forgot how to get up to the pulpit. <laughs> I was going to have to jump. Anyway, it is good to be back here. Today, as we said, is called Trinity Sunday. It's like the, the climax of the, the festival half of the church year. Kind of a summary of, of who God is. We've celebrated the, the major festivals of the church year. We've had Christmas and, of course, Easter and last Sunday, Pentecost. And, of course, all the Sundays in between. And so this Sunday has been set aside to kind of celebrate uh, what God has revealed about himself to us. We've learned that there is one and only one God. But God has chosen to reveal himself to us in three major activities as creator, as redeemer, and as sanctifier. I'll get to that later. Or to put it another way, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is Trinity Sunday. Today we, we pause from our daily activities and our worries and all kind of things we're spending our time doing to just pause and stand in awe of the mighty acts of the triune God. And that's what we'll be reviewing this morning. First of all, as God the Father, God is our creator. As you read in Psalm 8 a minute ago, one of my favorites, by the way, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. When I look at thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast established, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? <clears throat> I remember as a child, I went to Bible camp one summer, <clears throat> Camp Christmas it was, and after it was dark and everybody had gone to bed, one of the adult leaders took us out into this open field and we had our blankets or sleeping bags with us and we put them on the ground and we laid down and looked up at the skies and beheld all the stars that were there. I really hadn't seen that many before in town. And then our leader pointed out the various constellations out there with his flashlight shining up there and pointing out all the stars. And I gotta tell you, I was simply spellbound by the vastness of the universe. You see the stars and you wonder, well, that's a long ways off. I wonder what's on the other side of those stars. And how far does that go? It's really impressive. Hard to see stars anymore, of course. Later, I learned some incredible facts about the universe. <clears throat> I'll share a few of them with you this morning. Our sun, which is actually a star, which is shining bright right now, is so large that you could fit a million Earths into it. It's that big. Now, it's 93 million miles away. Don't ask me how they figured out how far, how far the sun is from the Earth. I mean, you'd have to have a long tape measure to figure that out. 93 million miles away, and yet we can feel the heat of that star striking us in the face on a hot Texas summer day. Now, light travels, I'm told, at the speed of 186,000 miles a second. Is that right, guys? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Just seeing if you're paying attention. 186,000 miles per second. What that means is you could go all the way around the earth seven and a half times in one second. Now that's really moving, okay? If we could travel at the speed of light, how long would it take us to get to the sun? I'll tell you, eight minutes. It's a long ways off. My, uh, my wife, <clears throat> has some Norwegian ancestors. <clears throat> and so I can tell this story. Oli and, and Sven, Oli and Sven, one day, they were planning to build a rocket to fly to the sun. Someone told them, Oli, you and Sven are crazy. 
you can't fly to the sun, you'll, you'll burn up halfway before you get there. Well, he said he had already taken that into consideration. He said, oh yeah, we already thought about that. We're going to fly at night. Okay. Our solar system, which is composed of the sun and how many planets? Well, it depends whether you plant Pluto or not. And I'm counting Pluto because that's who I learned. Nine planets. Okay, that's our solar system. Our solar system finds its home in what we call the, the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy contains a bunch of other suns or stars. In fact, possibly as many as 400 billion stars. That's in our Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy. 400 billion stars. And I'm told it's shaped like a disk, kind of like a, a frisbee, okay? And, as I told you a while ago, if you could travel at the speed of light, it would take eight minutes to get to the sun. At the same speed, do you know how long it would take us to go from one edge of our galaxy to the other? I'll tell you. 100,000 years to go from one end of the galaxy to the other. That's how huge our Milky Way galaxy is. Mighty big. Bigger than Texas. <clears throat> but the Milky Way galaxy <clears throat> is not the only galaxy in the universe. How many other galaxies are there? Would you believe billions, billions of other galaxies? Each one composed of billions of stars. In fact, one of the brightest stars we see in the sky at night, I'm told, is called Andromeda. If you look at that star through a powerful telescope, you'll discover it's really not a star at all. It's a galaxy all itself. And it's about two to three million miles, light years, excuse me, light years away. That's our closest galaxy. <clears throat> okay, this could go on and on, but you get the idea. When we say that God created the heavens and the earth, we're talking about a lot of work. Compared to the entire cosmos, our planet is but a pinprick, a grain of sand lying in a vast desert. So the psalmist was right on target when he asked the obvious questions, what is man that thou art mindful of him? With all there is in the universe, who are we? Now the Bible tells us that God is not only mindful of us, aware of us, but that he also cares about each one of us. He knows each hair on our heads. He knows us intimately. He knows our history, our ancestry, our, our future, our happy days, our sad days, our worries, our hopes. And yes, he knows our sins against him and one another. He knows it all. But most of all, this almighty and sovereign, awesome creator of the universe loves us. Just like a, a nurturing mother loves the child she has brought into the world, so the creator God loves the creatures he has brought into the world. What is man compared to the rest of the vast universe? As Psalm 8 continues to say, Thou hast made him little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. Wow. God has breathed life into you and me and in spite of our sins, continues to provide for us every day and to love each and every one of us. What a God. What a God the Creator, God the Father. Which brings us now to the second mighty act of God. Besides being our Creator, God the Son is our Redeemer. What does that mean? Any of you remember the olden days when they used to pass out SNH green stamps? A few of you, yeah. Those of you that never heard of that, I'll tell you what it was. When you go to the store, when you went to the store, based on how much you bought, 
they'd give you these stamps, lots and lots of stamps, and they were green. I don't know why they were called SNH. I guess that's somebody's name. But uh, then when you got home, you had this little little booklet, and you'd glue all these stamps in the pages of this little book. And by the end of that, your tongue was green, and your hands were green. Anyway, then you finally fill up this book, then you'd get another book. And you'd keep on collecting all these books until you had enough to, to redeem them. What you'd do is you'd have this catalog, and you'd look to see, well, how much does something cost, like a, a radio? Maybe that would cost six books. Or a TV, maybe that'd be 40 books, or whatever, you get the idea. So what you do then, you take these books and you'd go to the uh, place called a redemption center. It was a store where they had all these articles and then you'd hand in your book and you'd to redeem them for some article. Redemption center. Jesus is our redeemer and what he has redeemed is not some article in a catalog. He has redeemed you and me. And not with gold stamps or with silver or gold. No. He's redeemed us through his very life, right? Greater love hath no man. The Lord of the universe took on flesh and blood, lived among us on this little planet, and gave his holy and innocent life to redeem us sinners, to trade his life for ours, to gain our forgiveness, to cleanse us of our sin, and make us worthy to live forever in his glorious uh, eternal home. There's a story about a judge who once uh, <clears throat> excuse me, heard a case against a young man who was guilty of some horrible crimes. And at the conclusion of the trial, the man was found guilty. Well, his sentence was the death penalty. Then the, the judge, who was seated behind his bench, asked, the, young, uh, asked the, uh, the criminal to stand as he pronounced the verdict and the punishment. However, then the judge did something rather unusual, never done it before, in fact. He stood up from his chair and and removed his robe and walked around to the front of the bench and approached the prisoner and announced to the whole crowd there in the courthouse that he was going to take the place of this prisoner. He would go to prison in place of the criminal. He would go to the electric chair, the judge would, in place of the criminal. The judge would pay for the criminal's crime. And so he said to the guards, release the prisoner. He's free to go. Take me instead. That judge redeemed that man's life. Jesus is our redeemer. Through him, we are released from our sins and we are free to live as his forgiven people. What a God we have. God the Son our Redeemer. And that brings us to the third person of the triune God, God the Holy Spirit. How we live now as, as our Redeemer's forgiven people is a process called sanctification. There's that word. In fact, that's another name for the Holy Spirit, the sanctifier. God the Spirit sanctifies us. Now, sanctification is one of those $50 words that means simply to, to, to make sacred, to make holy, to make clean. Any of you go to the grocery store and you look for some uh, cleansing agent and you see this guy standing with his arms on his hips and he's got a bald head. What's his name? Mr. Clean. <laughs> Mr. Clean, Mr. Clean, Mr. Clean. Next time you see a bottle of Mr. Clean, think of the Holy Spirit. Because God makes us clean, clean of our sin, right? He takes away the dirt of our lives, the filth, the failures, the wrongdoings, the disobedience, the trespasses, the sins that cling so closely and weigh us down. The term for that act of making us clean is sanctification. 
So next time you're cleaning your, whatever you clean at home, think you're sanctifying your sink, huh? <laughs> making it clean. Well, that's a bit of a stretch. You get the idea. The Holy Spirit makes us clean. And that work is beyond our ability because we're still sinful creatures, you know. As a song goes that you probably learned a long time ago, we are weak, but he is strong, right? So we're still hampered by our sinful nature, but the Holy Spirit is at work. The Holy Spirit's helping us to grow in our Christian life. And I hope we continue to grow as long as we live, grow in our love for one another, grow in our love for God. Through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we can have fruitful lives, even though we are weak. We can have faith, even though on our own we cannot understand everything about God or even believe in Him. We can have peace, even though we may have really good reason to be worried. We can rejoice, even when bad things happen to us. We can show kindness and gentleness, even to people who are mean to us. We can forgive others, even though they don't deserve it. We can love one another, even though even those who are not at all lovable. Not because we're so strong, but because the Holy Spirit, God, is with us and helping us. Do you have faith? Do you believe in God? Do you have peace? Do you show kindness to others? Can you forgive those who have hurt you? Can you love people who are not very lovable? If you can answer yes, then the Holy Spirit has been at work in you. We can even pray when we are at a loss for words. As we read in Romans 8, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. All that is the work of the Holy Spirit. God is with us. Remember, Emmanuel, God is with us. We can't see God any more than we can see the air around us, but we can see the results of His work. In 2 Corinthians, St. Paul writes, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. We are new creations in Christ. And we grow in Christ and lead fruitful lives because of the work of the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, we would not be able to say Jesus Christ is Lord and we would not have fruitful lives. So there you have it. What a fantastic God there is. A creator of this vast and enormous, ever-expanding universe a loving Redeemer who has given His very life for our eternal lives, and a sanctifier, God with us, who daily cleanses us of our sin and helps us to grow as Christians. So glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the triune God. Glory be. That's our place to praise and glorify this wonderful God. Amen. God, our Father, how beautiful is your creation. Lord Jesus, thank you for redeeming us from sin and death. O oh, Holy Spirit, help us to grow in grace. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.